Uh, <laughs> We have the Ark of the Covenant here, as we talked about last week. This is a picture of Jesus. We've got the, the wings of the cherubim, the mercy seat, which is a picture of the perfect work of Jesus that was molded out of one solid piece of gold. And we have the box here. It's the Ark. Um, and that word in Hebrew, the first time it was used, is actually referring to the coffin that carried Jesus. So it's literally like a coffin that carries something. And uh, in there, we saw that God put the law, the ten, uh, the two stone tablets with the Ten Commandments on it. He, he he put the the manna and he put Aaron's rod that budded. He put those in there, a picture of man's rejection of his perfectness, his his uh, law. We see man's rejection of his leadership and man's rejection of his bread, the bread of life of Jesus. And he put that in there. Why? Because he didn't want to see that in dealing with you. And he said, Moses, put that in there. And then you're going to put the mercy seat, a picture of my son and his work on top of it. And I will sit here and speak to you from this place. So when we stand here before God in his presence, he doesn't see your imperfection. In order for you to see your imperfection, to see your sin, you have to remove Jesus. Now that's a big deal because there was a, a group of people, uh, Israelis, they got the ark in their town, Beth Shemesh, and they got pretty excited. They were like, oh my gosh, look, we got the ark. And what they did was they lifted the mercy seat and looked in. And a bunch of people died. Thus, you have Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> but Harrison Ford was smart enough not to look. He, he didn't look in there. But the truth remains that you open this up to, remove, to, to look in here, you have to remove the work of Jesus. Now, what's interesting about the very first thing recorded that God spoke to the children of Israel, spoke to Moses from above this seat, is what my life is all about, my call. Like, I have a, a very specific calling. There are um, preachers and teachers and evangelists and apostles and prophets and, and different ministries where people excel in one area, like they specialize in, in leadership, others specialize in this and that, you know, all the different subjects and stuff. For me, literally, and I get this all the time, the Holy Spirit reminding me when I'm putting my messages together, when I'm spending time with Him, is stay on message, stay on message, stay on message. And this message for me is all about preaching Jesus. That's it. All my life is all about Jesus. Everything is just about Jesus. And some people might not like that. Jesus, you talk about Jesus every service. What's up with that? That's my life. That's what God called me to do. And so many times I try to get off and I try to get off on other things and, and study things and I just hear the Holy Spirit stay on message, stay on message, stay on message. And so many times I, I'm trying to get off other things because I don't think Jesus alone is enough. How many of us we look at if I just had more money, if I just had more healing, if I just had more power, if I just had more this, if I just had more that, and you're looking at those things because you see that the money can buy something for you because you think that thing, whether it's your electricity bill being paid or whether it's that car you want, you think that will bring fulfillment in your life. But no, you'll find out once you get that thing, once you get that money, once you get that miracle even, when you get those things, those miracles are not what bring fulfillment. It is the presence of Jesus and him alone that brings fulfillment. And the problem I have with people that are always looking at their finances to see about how blessed they are and looking at if I just have more money, you know, it's like I, I need my electricity, but I ain't got no hot water, I ain't got no electricity. Well, you know what? There, there might be a time in your life where God calls you to a place where there aren't any cars or electricity or hot water. What are you going to do in those moments? Does it mean God's not there because you don't have it? You know, Paul said, I know how to have everything and I know how to have nothing. In both cases, I'm the same because Jesus is my everything. So I don't care if you are broke and I don't care if you're rich. You have Jesus and that is enough. That's it. Jesus, that's why I preach Jesus. And the first thing God spoke to Moses from above the mercy seat was instructions on a candlestick the menorah, where there would be three branches on one side, three branches on the other side of the single branch. John was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and he saw Jesus. No, he saw seven candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, he saw Jesus. 
This center branch is none other than a picture of Jesus. And God spoke to Moses about how he would build this candlestick, that each of these three branches would be lit on, would be, would light on fire and point to the center branch. All they did was burn and point towards the center branch. All my life is to burn and point to Jesus. That is it. It is not complicated. My life is to bring glory to the center branch because the burning and the passion and that fire in me is not from me. It is from the Holy Spirit and his righteousness. The, the lamp would be lit. It would be a piece of linen cloth, a picture of righteousness, and it would be stuck in the lamp that had oil, a picture of the Holy Spirit. And God said in Isaiah 62, I will not rest until your righteousness goes forth as brightness and your salvation as a lamp that burns. He made you righteous and he filled you with his spirit so that you could point to the center branch, so you could say it's all about Jesus and Jesus alone and that's what God's speaking to us when we enter his presence it says in Hebrews chapter 1 that God at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke to us through the prophets but now in these last days he has spoken to us through his son you know what's amazing about this Jesus is that when John sees him in Revelation, in Revelation 13, 8, he's referred to as the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. Think about that for a second. That means God created everything with the lamb slain in mind. God could have been any kind of God. We're, we're pretty lucky that he's a good dude. Okay, we God could have been mean, but but look, we we some we, we sometimes think God is God God has love. God's a loving God. Uh 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 uh. He is love. He is love. He, it's not like he chooses. Oh, I'm going to be loving sometimes and sometimes not. It's he is love. Period. Man, when I, I get emotional, sorry. And I had a lot of coffee and my mouth is dry and it's just like a lot of emotions going on right now. Okay. <laughs> and and God, God created us with a free will, fully knowing that because he gave us a free will, and two weeks ago, Pastor Tom did a message on this and I recommend go back and listen to it because I don't have time. He gave us a free will and we use that free will to, to really spit in his face. We use this free will to say, God, I got this without you. I know you created me and everything else, but <laughs> I, got, I got it from here. But God saw Jesus as a lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. So, so God used this thing called sin. Oh my gosh. God used our, our rebellion to him to choose to reveal his full nature of love and grace. Because if we never sinned, we never get the full expression of his nature. Yes, Adam and, knew, Adam and Eve knew he was loving and he was a good God and everything, but they did not know to the full extent of how good he is because they hadn't sinned yet. So they didn't know that God would love them no matter what. It took our sin and our rejection and our rebellion and he turned around and used that and said, now I'm going to reveal to you so you can see who I really am by sending you my son to die in your place. And th this is our God who decided to reveal his nature through the crucifixion of his very son whom he loved. And I need you to understand that everything in this universe and with God revolves around the son. The first time love is mentioned in the Bible is with Abraham and Isaac. And God tells Abraham, Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love and offer him up as a burnt offering. Now God's not expecting Isaac to be sacrificed because Jesus interrupts it. Why? God is speaking and prophesying about him sending his son, his only son, whom he loved. The first time love is mentioned in the Bible is the love between the father and the son. And he would send his son as a lamb to bear our iniquity, our sin, our shame, and die on that cross. And now he says, now you get to know me as love and see my grace. There was a time 
on this earth where God, though he was loved, couldn't just bless you, couldn't just take care of you. It was this time of law where God could not just bless you because there was something called sin. And if he was to go around and just take care of you and bless you because of sin, then how is he just? How is he a righteous God? He has to be righteous. Sin cannot go unpunished. But he gave the law to point to Jesus. He gave the law to show, look, you guys are struggling right now. You aren't perfect. You see your sin. You see what you look like apart from me. But there is a man coming. There is a man coming who will do away with that condemnation, who will do away with that sin, who will do away with all of that iniquity. And I need you to start building expectation for him. I need you to start looking for him. I need you to start getting excited for him. But the, 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 the children of Israel did not. There were a few, but they saw the law as it. They saw righteousness, no problem. I got this. I can wash my hands and I can live right and follow the law and be okay. And the Pharisees saw Jesus, the Son of God, before them and rejected him. But those who were full of sin, hopelessness, with nothing in this earth, saw Jesus, saw God. It was the time of the sun was coming. And we fast forward to Jesus being born into the earth. And, and it's the time of, uh, for Jesus to be um, dedicated in the temple. And, and Mary, uh, J Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to the temple on the eighth day to be circumcised. And there waiting there was a man named Simeon. Now, Simeon is a special name. It comes from the Hebrew word Shema, and Shema means to hear. And every, every Jewish festival, every Jewish feast, I think even every, uh, some people every day at morning and at evening, they will quote the great Shema, which is hear, O Israel, our God is one. It is their way to summarize the law because from there it says you shall love your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and strength. Jesus said the greatest commandment in the, in the law is what? To love your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. So here's Simeon, a picture of the law where mankind for 1500 years has been trying to love God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind and strength. Saul came, he failed. David came, he failed. All the prophets, all the great men of God, no one loved God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. It was impossible. And Simeon was a man led by the Holy Spirit, and his prayer was, God, let me see your Messiah before I leave, before I depart. Now I'm going somewhere. Follow, stick with me. And Simeon sees this child and sees that it's the Messiah. The law was happy to see Jesus come. The law was looking forward to Jesus because its whole point was to point you to this Jesus. And here Simeon, a picture of the law comes and sees Jesus and says, now I am ready to depart. The time of the law in your life is ready to depart. Why? Because it's the time of the son. It's the time of Jesus. And he blessed the parents. Why didn't he bless the child? Because the less is blessed by the greater. The law can't bless Jesus. It's Jesus that blesses us. And then right after he left and departed, there was a, a woman, a prophetess named Hannah, or Anna, sorry. Anna comes from the Hebrew word kanan, which means favor. favor. <laughs> Grace. Grace comes over and sees Jesus. And she was old, and she was one that would be at the temple fasting and praying all day, waiting for the consolation of Israel, waiting for the Redeemer to come and hear this. She sees this Jesus. Now notice, Simeon blessed him and took off. His time was done. He's going to die. <laughs> Literally, he's going to go die. He was waiting for Jesus. But this woman sees him, and then she leaves and goes, hey, everybody, the Redeemer's here. Salvation is here. What am I saying? The law departed. The time of Jesus and his grace has come. And the message of his grace is your redeemer is alive. Your redeemer is here. And Paul, a man, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee of Pharisees, one who was blameless in keeping the law, was on the road to Damascus. And then all of a sudden this bright light overshadowed him and knocked him off his horse. And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. 
And what happens is Paul has something like scales over his eyes and he gets carried away over to this house and, and, and God appears to a prophet or a, a man named Ananias. And he tells Ananias, there's a man named Saul of Tarsus who's waiting by a place called Straight. I want you to go and pray for him and, and his eyes will be open. Now I want you to see Paul was fighting and persecuting the Christians, persecuting those who named Jesus. He was a terrorist, man. He was taking you Christians and throwing them in jail. He was behind the, 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 the stoning of Stephen. And, and so this man was, he was so zealous for God, but it was not according to correct knowledge. It was not according to the new way of Jesus. And God finds this man named Ananias. And what's amazing is God could have picked any man. God could have picked any prophet to appear to. There were many of them there. But he picks a man named Ananias, whose name also means grace. He picks grace to go and pray for Paul. Grace comes, lays his hands on him, and the first person, the first thing Paul sees when the scales fall from his eyes are grace. We're on the subject of pursuing grace. Grace is not just a topic. It's not just a message. It's not just like, okay, you know, we're going to talk about grace now. Or, you know, it's like, grace is cool, but, and I hear that all the time, man. It's like, grace is awesome. I'm so thankful for my, I'm saved and, and going to heaven and stuff. But, it's always that big but. You got to get that but out the way or you're in trouble. Grace isn't just that. Because grace is all about Jesus. Great. You can't talk about grace without talking about Jesus. You can't talk about Jesus without talking about grace. Because God chose that grace and truth would come through his son, Jesus. And the time of Jesus has come. In John chapter 5, you'll see that Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. He said, the way you honor my father is by honoring me. Look at that in John 5, 19, verse 23. Then Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself but what He sees the Father do. For whatever He does, likewise the Son does. For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all things that He Himself does, and He will show Him greater works than these, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom He will. The Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all men should honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. I want you to see that this whole thing, everything, from the candlestick, from the ark, from the law, the Old Testament, to Jesus coming, everything is about Jesus. You can spend years and years going to seminary and reading this Bible and totally miss the whole point of what this is all about. This is all about a man named Jesus. This is all about him. And when you start seeing Jesus as your everything, you start seeing him as your all in all, my goodness, that's when your life starts to prosper. There was a man named David, and David was called by God a man after God's own heart. What was it about David that made him him, a man after God's own heart. He sinned just like others, right? What was it about him that made him a man after God's own heart? Because there was this thing called the Ark of the Covenant, which was a picture of his son. And Saul, when he was king of Israel, let the Ark of the Covenant remain in the wilderness in Ephrata without ever going to it, without ever bringing it to make it the center of the kingdom. In other words, Jesus was just a side thing. Jesus was a piece of the pie. Jesus was something that I'm adding to my life so hopefully I can get some blessings. Jesus was someone we talk about every now and then. Jesus, you know, it wasn't everything. But David said something. Oh. David said in Psalm 132, I think I have it on the screen. Oh, I don't have it. <laughs> you got to turn to it. In Psalm 132, verse 1, it says, O Lord, remember David in all his afflictions, how he swore unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob, I will not come into my house, nor go up to my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty God of Jacob. We heard of it in Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of Jar. We will go to his dwelling place. We will worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, go to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. David was the only one that cared about this, the presence of God. David took this, which was just a side note, the presence of God is important. Like how, 
how much of us go through life like the presence of God isn't everything. And it's easy to get, but I mean, we live in this world where there's so many things pulling us, dragging us over here, and we can forget that the presence of God is everything, that Jesus is absolutely everything. He's not a part of your life. He is your life. And it's not like he's an egomaniac, like, I got to be the center of your life. It's like, no, guys, that's, that's called prospering. That's called, that's putting things in right order. That's the order God has it in, and he's inviting you to receive that, which is everything in the center of the universe, his son Jesus. And David said, I will not sleep. I will not stop until I find a resting place for this ark, until I build a house for this. And David was a man after God's own heart, because who was God's heart? His son. You want to find who's on my heart and Angela's heart? Our daughter. You want to honor me? You honor my daughter. You want, to, you want to bless me? You bless me by blessing my daughter. And that's what Jesus came and revealed. He said, you want to honor my father? You have to honor me. Jesus was the full expression of the nature of God. I find so many of us, we wonder, what is the will of God? What would God do in this situation? Who is God? What's his nature like? What's his? Just look at Jesus. Jesus came and revealed the perfect nature, the perfect expression of who he is. God decided that his glory wouldn't shine from his own face, but his glory would shine from the face of Jesus Christ. So that we would now behold Jesus, and as we behold Jesus, as we behold his face, as we behold his glory, we are being transformed by the Spirit into that same image we're beholding. See, I used to think, what's the most practical thing I can give somebody when I'm praying for them? Someone that's going through a, a real-life crisis, someone that's going through something and they need something immediately. What do I give them? If you would have asked me years ago, I would have given them five, five steps to out, out of your problem, which, you know, five steps, you're just picking and choosing a couple things, hoping they work. And I was trying real hard to help people and stuff, but my goodness, I was never, never fully agreeing and believing that the Bible in this new covenant is all about what you believe. And so I wasn't giving them something to believe in. I wasn't giving them the who to place their trust in. This new covenant is all about a relationship with Jesus and our trust in him. So when I now find someone that's going through a life challenge, someone who's experiencing something, I give them Jesus. I preach to them Jesus because as Jesus is being preached, that only in that moment when Jesus is being preached can the Holy Spirit start to work. It's in those moments that miracles happen. And it's only in those moments when you are hearing Jesus magnified. I'm telling you, when Jesus walked on the road to Emmaus, he could have preached any message to those two disciples to get them out of their sadness and unbelief. But Jesus preached about himself from the old covenant. And that's the message that will bring freedom to people is because when you preach Jesus, the Holy Spirit works. When you preach Jesus, you have someone to believe in. When you see Jesus, your whole life is transformed and changed just by hearing, just by seeing him. So you're saying just seeing Jesus is enough? Just seeing him, that, that'll fix everything? Yes, look at Moses in Hebrews 11. It says Moses was faithful and he endured. And that word endured means stayed strong. If you didn't know, Moses lived to be 120 and his eyes never dimmed and his natural vigor never went away. It's like a mix of like New King James and King James. But, and basically he died at 120 strong and with perfect eyesight. What kept him strong? It says he, was, he stayed strong as seeing him who was invisible. Oh. He stayed strong by seeing him who is invisible. And then we are told in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, let's, 1 and 2, let us run our race looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I had it all wrong for so long. <laughs> it's all about looking to Jesus. It's all about him. And David, when he brought this ark into Jerusalem, I love it. He had the whole nation of Israel lined up on the streets, man. They all came. There was a wonderful, marvelous celebration day because we are bringing Jesus back to the center of our kingdom. What will happen when America starts bringing Jesus back to the center of our churches? 
when we start bringing Jesus back to the center of our message, Jesus back to worship, Jesus back to everything. It's all about him. It's not about me. It's not about our crowds. It's not about what's going on, what I look like, how much money. It's all about Jesus. It's all about bringing honor to him. It's all about magnifying his name. And when you do, there is great grace and great power. And David had them line up. And I love it because the priests were carrying the ark on their shoulders. And every six steps, David would sacrifice an ox or a bull. Every six steps all the way to Israel, all the way to Jerusalem. And you know what David's doing? Now, some of you guys won't like this. I used to not like it. I was too dignified. I was too cool. David, in front of all of his constituents, in front of all of his voters. Just kidding. They didn't vote. But in front of all of his people, here's the mighty King David, the one that slayed 10,000s, that, that, that cut off the head of the giant. And you know what David is doing in the presence of Jesus, in the presence of God? He is dancing and he is spinning and he is going crazy in the midst of everybody, so much so that his clothes are coming off. Oh my gosh, David didn't care what you thought. And you know what David called that? He said, I will continue to humble myself before God. Oh. I was listening to a podcast recently, and um, it was a prophetic podcast, and they were talking about this, uh, I don't know, Rick Joyner, I don't know if anybody knows that name, maybe you know that name, Rick, Rick Joyner, you, you do? Oh, of course, yeah, of course. <laughs> Rick Joyner, um, he was talking about, he had an encounter with Jesus a couple weeks ago, and the Lord appeared to him, and he started talking about this, the, the next move of God or what's coming. He was a part of the Toronto outpouring, I believe, and, and everything that happened in Toronto, the Toronto Blessing years ago, back in the 90s, which Pete, Pastor Tom was also. And, um, and the Lord spoke to him and said, this next move is going to be a move of joy. A move of joy. And I heard that, and I was like, yeah, we got to start having fun. <laughs> I'm telling you, church has been so somber and serious and I'm just like my goodness what is going on and I used this was me back in the day when I was ushering you know <laughs> <laughs> and I remember a lady she said Josh smile man why are you so serious I was like no I'm on guard <laughs> I don't know when these devils might pop out I gotta I gotta be ready at all times and I literally couldn't be joyful in the presence of God. It was a, literally, it was, it was a little thing I had to be delivered from. And, and it was something that I, I didn't, because, because it, it just all comes down to, I didn't think God was really pleased to have me in his presence. So because I, didn't, I wasn't convinced that God was excited that I was with him, how could I be joyful? So I'm, I'm going up, approaching him, like, I'm serious, God, I'm, I'm not going to make a mistake. I'm going to be perfect. I'm going to be careful. But what ends up happening is you end up avoiding him altogether because you just would rather not experience that rejection or so you think there's rejection because I, I don't know about you, but if, has anybody battled insecurities before? I know I'm, I'm one that can tell you I've battled a lot of insecurities in my past. And what happens is you start looking to people that you need their acceptance in order to feel valuable about yourself. And so because I was insecure, I always had to be whoever they wanted me to be. And I created this Jekyll and Hyde where I was never real. I was two people. I was one person at church and I was another person in private. At church, I was a certain way. And in private, I was another way because I was trying to perform and have this character that the church expected so I could be accepted. But then in private, the true heart, the true crap I was in would come out. And I don't know if you've been there, but then Jesus showed up in my life. It's like Paul, when Paul said, and then God was pleased to reveal his son in me. And then I realized when one day I, when I was praying to God and God spoke to me in the midst of all my garbaggio and he says, I love you, son. I said, no, that's impossible. How can you love me when I haven't performed? How can you love me when I haven't been perfect? How can you love me? I, and, and I realized, my goodness, when I come into his presence, Psalm says there's fullness of joy. 
My goodness, he wants us dancing. He wants us celebrating. He doesn't want life to be so serious all the time and so hectic and crazy. But when you look to Jesus and only when you look to Jesus can you experience that joy. Because what the devil will do is try to get you looking back at yourself. See, because the law says, you shall not, you shall not, you shall not, you shall not. Jesus came, did away with that, and now it's God saying, I will, I will, I will, I will. There is a new object, and his name is Jesus. And when I see Jesus, I see what he wills, what he's done, what he's doing, and that gives me joy. Oh, Jesus. And you can see why David was so excited. David was an old covenant man, a new covenant man living in old covenant times, worshiping Jesus. You know what heaven's doing right now? You want to know? They're worshiping Jesus. They're saying, worthy is the lamb. And you know what astonishes me? And maybe this is just me. The only man-made thing in heaven are the holes in Jesus' hands. I don't know about you. I probably would have asked for some plastic surgery. Like, do I have to really have this for eternity? Come on. I did the work. Like, let me have my cool hands back. But Jesus is not ashamed of those holes. Our king, our king with all power and all authority uses it only for you. Only to bless you. Only to benefit you. He never uses it to harm you. He never uses it to hurt you. He only uses his great power to help you. It was Jesus that came down the mountain and there was the leper. And the leper, like all of us, God, I know you are able, but will you heal me? And this king with all power, this king with all authority, this king who came bearing grace and truth, didn't just say yes, didn't just heal him, but reached out his hand and embraced the leper. Who knows when the last time that man had felt a human touch? Who knows that last time that man had felt accepted by somebody? And here he is in the midst of his lowest point of being a leper and an outcast. And the king himself is accepting him with arms wide open and an embrace. I realize the Holy Spirit is not just here for power. He's not just here to, to show off or anything. He is here as God's kiss to you. He is the one that is in you, telling you how to be a son, how to be a daughter. He is the one that says, Abba, Father, from inside your heart. He is the one that comforts you. He is the one that embraces you and loves on you. And you know how he does it all. Jesus said, when he comes, he will testify of me. He will point you to me. He will show you me. Where should I go, Jesus, from this? Look at Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared. I want to remind you that it wasn't Moses that led the children of Israel into the promised land. It wasn't the law that would bring you into your destiny. But it was a man named Joshua. Hey whose name in Hebrew is the same name pretty much as the name Jesus, which means Yah, Yahweh, God is my salvation. It took a Joshua to lead the children of Israel into the promised land, into their destiny. Just like it would be a Jesus, the grace of God that appeared to all men that would bring you into your salvation. When Moses, when Joshua was crossing into the promised land, I want you to see this. God gave Joshua instructions on how to do it. He told Joshua to have the, the, Levi, the Levitical priests to carry this ark on their shoulders. And they would put this ark on their shoulders. And as soon as they're... Let me, I didn't tell you that information. There's a river here. That's the promised land. There's a river Jordan here. And the only way into the promised land to go beat Jericho is they have to cross that river Jordan. And God tells Joshua, as soon as the priest's feet 
touch the river Jordan, the water will be removed. The water will go back. And he says, tell the priest to go and bring this and carry this out into the middle of the Jordan and let all the children of Israel cross. This is in Joshua 4, 5, and 6, you'll see. And so the, the priests carry the, the ark, which is a picture of the presence of God. They walk over and they enter the Jordan. And then the children of Israel cross by in front of it. I want you to see something. This is a type of baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is a type of baptism in the presence of God. Being led by Joshua. Now I want you to see Jesus came and said, I'm the first and the last. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I want you to see the common theme throughout the word that this is about Jesus. And sometimes it doesn't make sense. You're like, well, where's the life application for this? Life application is like Jesus. I don't know. I don't know. Just it helps me. Anyways, walks out into the center, and all the children of Israel go. So notice Jesus was the first one in. And he waited until all the children of Israel crossed the river onto the other side. And then the ark followed up behind. Jesus was the first and the last. See, some of us are concerned about our standing with God or our relationship with God and where we are. Are we on good terms? But what I'm telling you is that Jesus was the first and he is in the last. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, sealed in the Holy Spirit doesn't mean the potential for you to be open again. It means that you are completely and totally in Christ. So that when I put this phone in my Bible and you say, find my phone, what do you see? You see my Bible. Do you see my phone? No, you see my Bible, okay? So when God says, where's Josh? He sees Jesus Christ. Oh, you didn't have to clap. <laughs> but that's good. <laughs> oh my gosh. So many. You see Jesus. But see, when we were under the law, we saw ourselves. Follow? We're looking at ourselves, our ugliness. But under, under grace, we see Jesus. As 1 John 4, 17 says, as Jesus is, not as he was, okay? That would have been cool. But it's as he is. This is King Jesus, okay? This is King Jesus that if he walked in this room right now, I mean, how many of you know he's here? But then he can also come in. Like, he can come in and you and I would all be on the floor rolling around and acting fools because Jesus is in here. But that's cool, man. Jesus, you can do whatever you want. Like, I'm open for whatever. I just want to experience you, you know. I got off track there, but that's an invitation, Jesus. Oh, gosh. I, I, th I thought Jesus showed up. I thought I was going to turn around and see Jesus. Where was I? You guys interrupted me with the clapping and stuff. All right. So, all right. Jesus is cool. Um, Jesus is the first and the last. And they, they anyways, they, I don't remember where I was, so we're just moving on. Um, but Jesus is the first and the last, and you are completely in Christ. As he is, so are you in this world. And I want you to notice something that's really significant about this is there's no insignificant details in the Bible is that the river Jordan, the word Jordan is, comes from two Hebrew root words. The first one, Yarad and Din. Yarad means to descend down into and Din means judgment. Jesus stepped down into our judgment and punishment and slapped the water back so that you and I could cross without experiencing any of that judgment. When Jesus stepped in, he, see, see God didn't just go light on sin. He's not like, oh, well, you know, I've changed my mind. Sin's okay. No, he had to completely punish our sin. And he completely exhausted all judgment and punishment on his son. And he had his son descend into our judgment, the perfect righteous one who never committed sin so that we could cross into our destiny with all of his righteousness. And notice that God didn't just move the water a couple feet away from the ark or a couple yards or a hundred feet. He moved the water all the way back to a town called Adam. God Oh my gosh. All judgment, 
all of your punishment for anything you have done or will do has already been exhausted in the body of Jesus. And he is the first and the last, which is why I'm saying what he, he said, it is finished. So when you cross over from death into life, from a prisoner of sin to a prisoner of righteousness, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of, of the son of his love. That took place the moment you believed. And when that took place, you crossed over and Jesus sealed you from behind. There is no way you could ever experience the punishment or the judgment of God again because of the work of Jesus. Look at Titus 3, 7 real quick. Titus 3, Titus 3, Titus 3, 3, 7. We also once were foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving very various desires and pleasures, living in evil and envy, filled with hatred and hating each other. Yeah, that describes us pretty well, our past. Some of us are now too. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward mankind appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. All judgment, all punishment, all condemnation has been bore in the body of Jesus. Listen to me. The devil shows up. His name's Satan. He accuses you of stuff you've done. Not stuff you haven't done. That ain't much of an accusation. Josh, hey, uh, uh, you know, you murdered that guy last week. I did not. That doesn't work on me. But you know what he does? He brings up things I have done. Josh, you did this. You were you messed up here. Josh, you did that. And we see that in Zechariah when, when Joshua, the high priest, is actually standing before Jesus and Satan. And Satan's accusing Joshua of sin before Jesus. And Jesus doesn't take it. Jesus doesn't allow him to keep doing it. Jesus tells him to shut up. I rebuke you. You get out of here. And there's Joshua standing with dirty garments, dirty rags. He looks filthy. What is that? It's a filthy self-image. He sees himself as sinful. He sees himself as bad. His self-worth and value is of nothing. And because he sees himself that way, he behaves that way. And because he sees himself that way, he accomplishes nothing. And he's far from God. But Jesus will not stand by with you having that self-image. No, Jesus sent me here tonight to tell you that he removed those filthy rags and those filthy garments for you and he put on a brand new white robe that's his robe stained and washed in his own blood and then when he did that he put a brand new turban on your head a clean turban so that you don't sweat and you can remove those thoughts of a low self-image and you can see yourself the way he does which is clean and spotless that's our savior jesus he washed us and cleansed us I don't have to deal with insecurities anymore. Why? Because he cleansed me from it, man. He is my all in all. I don't look for glory or honor or praise from man. My father's honor and glory is enough. Jesus is enough. He is my everything. Next time the devil comes at you like that, the next time the, those thoughts of who, how bad you are, how dirty you are, how messed up you are. I want you to open your mouth. For instance, I'm a, I'm a minute over. I know. This is someone's life. I want you in your head to count to 10. And then I'm going to ask you to speak your name. Okay? Begin counting in your head now. Say your name. Okay, first of all, we need to work on obedience. <laughs> um, hello <laughs> I'm up here sweating my gosh and y'all can't even sit there and say your name out loud for those of you that participated maybe yeah maybe my instructions weren't clear we'll, we'll go with that um, for those of you that said your name what happened to the counting in your head it stopped right I think she got it so the next time those thoughts are in your head the next time those thoughts are in your head, don't try to fight it with another thought. No, 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 no. That's not the way God works. God gave us this. God spoke this world into existence. He didn't think it into existence. God, this is God's spoken word written down for us to put in our mouth and speak out. 
the next time those thoughts come into your mind, I want you to say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the author. The devil, you ain't got no faith. Jesus is the author and finisher of my faith. Nobody cares about you. My father loves me. He, for he so loved the world, he gave me his son. His son loved me and gave himself for me. Oh, but you don't have a future. God has called me, not according to my own works, but according to his own purpose and grace I'm called. The next time the devil comes with those thoughts, you open up your mouth and you speak the word of God and that devil can't get out fast enough. So many of us are waiting on Jesus to rebuke him. He's waiting on you to rebuke him. He's waiting on you to open up your mouth and take your place as the righteousness of God and not stand for that junk in your family, not stand for that junk in your life because you are a child of the most high God. You are not just some nobody. You are someone valuable. And that valuable was so much that Jesus said, I will come and give my life for you. I will bleed for you and I will live for you. And everything that I'm doing up there in heaven is for you as a mediator, as an intercessor. I'm believing in you. I'm praying for you. I'm here for you. I'm pushing you. I'm bringing people into your life. I'm bringing words into your life. I'm bringing prophecies into your life. I'm bringing power into your life. I'm doing all of this for you because I want to see you flourish. I want to see you prosper. I want to see your life take on meaning. I want you to walk in this fullness of who I made you to be before there was ever any sin. And sin will not stop this call. Sin will not stop this plan. It is by grace and grace alone, not your works. Thank you, Jesus. all bow our heads.